chemistry, lecture eight, we're going pretty fast through this. Um, I'll say a few words about that on Wednesday, but uh, you know, there's already a midterm kind of flavor coming along. So uh, we will just get into the right mood for that shortly. Okay? For now, we don't have to worry about it, but uh, just to let you know, uh, things are moving along. Today, we're going to talk about the naming of compounds. Okay, so we already talked about what compounds are, and uh, now we have to know how to give them a proper name and how to recognize them. So uh, let me turn back to these notations. This is what from the periodic table, right? And these are the elements. Element in its single form is an atom, and this is boron. And boron actually, uh, if you remember this from uh, the previous lecture, is a, uh, an element that is uh, not present at very high quantities on our planet. It's one of those elements that have a pretty big dip in the abundance graph that I've shown. Uh, but uh, I just bring up this issue for two reasons. The first reason is that boron, uh, one of my very first lectures, and I think it was the first year I was here at UCI, I was trying to make a joke about boron. Okay. Boron, I thought, was a funny word. I thought it was a very, uh, you know, a combination between somebody who's very boring and a moron. <laughs> <laughs> so I was joking about that a little bit, and I, I had a good time. Most of the people were laughing. But after class, there was a person coming to my uh, gig at the table, and he said, look, I didn't really like that joke at all. Because I happen to like boron. It's a great element, and I spent my entire summer working in a boron factory. <laughs> and I, didn't, I did not believe him, but I looked it up, and he's right. He said, I, I work close by, he said, I'm relatively close by, in a boron factory. There is a boron, well, not really a factory, it's more like a, a mine, if you want. Okay, so this is uh, Rio Tinto. It is uh, north of Los Angeles. It's one of the locations on our planet where there's a very high concentration of boron in the soil. And people here have a set up camp and are digging out that soil and filtering out boron. All right, here it is. Big chunk of boron. It looks a little metal-esque. Right? Uh, boron is an element, and as you can see, it is a metalloid. So it has both metallic and metallic properties. All right? So uh, for those of you interested in stories about elements, uh, this is a nice book to read. Okay, so if you're interested in you know, how elements got their names or peculiar properties uh, of elements, this is actually this is excellent reading. It's really, it's really a lot of fun. Here's boron once again. This is basically when you take it, the big clump of boron, you grind it up, it looks like this, like little, you know, like metallic looking pebbles. And uh, again, that's elemental boron. But elemental boron is not a compound. It's an elemental compound. It's not a compound made out of different kinds of elements. If I take this boron element and put it into something else, for instance, barium borate, you see here is boron. That is the element boron that sits in this particular compound. Right? This is an element, an elemental compound. This is not an elemental compound. This is a compound composed of multiple elements. This is barium borate. It's a glassy type of material. It's transparent, right? And just to let you know that these materials have nothing in common except for the fact that they contain boron elements. Okay? So this is not transparent whatsoever. This is. So completely different material properties if you put these atoms in different places and you give them different neighbors. Right? So I, I find it a fascinating uh, aspect of matter. Right? You take the same elements, you put them in a slightly different surrounding, and you get something completely different. All right, so what kind of name do these compounds have? You saw barium borate. That's a word, that's a name for that compound. So how do we assign certain names to certain compounds? Is there a set of rules? And the answer is yes. For the simplest compounds, there is a set of rules. And today we're going to talk about that. 
Okay, so let's talk with let's talk first about binary ions. Binary ions. That is a compound that contains two ions. Can you open any one? So the compound is a binary ion. Bi binary ionic ionic compound. Sodium chloride is a binary ionic compound because it contains two ions, a cation and an anion. Here they are, sodium plus chlorine minus. The name is sodium chloride. Another example, cesium bromide, also is a binary ionic compound. It contains two ions, a cation, cesium, and bromine minus, that's the anion. Its name is cesium bromide. Okay, so you see already a systematic here of the naming of these things. If you want to name binary ions, you have to look at the kind of metal that forms the cation. Okay? If the cation is a type 1 metal, then this kind of naming is appropriate. But if the type, if the, uh, sorry, if the metal is a type 2 metal, then uh, we have to make sure that we give this name an addition additional Roman name. So we have to make a distinction between type 1 metals and type 2 metals in terms of the naming of compounds that follow from these cations. So let's first start with binary ionic compounds that contain a type 1 metal. Okay, so what is the set of rules? Everybody can do this because it's a set of rules and if you follow it, you arrive at the right answer. So if you want to name a compound like that, you name the cation first and the anion second. Remember, sodium chloride. Sodium is the first element. You say sodium first, and then chloride. Chloride is the chlorine anion. That one is second. The monoatomic cation takes the name of the element. All right? Sodium chloride contains sodium. So. Uh, that monoatomic cation is just called sodium, sodium chloride. The monoatomic anion takes the root name of the element plus the suffix I, sodium chloride. The element is chlorine, but if you make the compound, you call it sodium chloride. That's the name of the anion. Okay, so here's a couple of other examples. This is a binary ionic compound. It contains two ions, the cation anion. The cation is Cesium plus. Cesium is a type 1 metal. So I just have to give it the name of the element, which is cesium, and then substitute that with the word chloride. Because that's the N ion name. The anion is made of fluorine atoms and the suffix I. Cesium chloride. Another one, aluminum chloride. Aluminum, that's the name of the metal. It's a type 1 metal. And then chlorine is becoming, is, is now called chloride because it's an anion. So aluminum chloride. But that's relatively straightforward. Now note that I don't bother here about the number of chlorine ions in there. Okay? There's three, but that's not specified here. It's just called aluminum chloride. How about this? What's this called? Calcium sulfide. Absolutely. Very good. Another one? Magnesium oxide. All right, all right. Very good. Now, how about those type 2 binary ions? What's the difference? So, if the compound contains a type 2 metal, then we have to do something extra. And that extra is we follow exactly the same set of rules as before, but we supplement the name of the cation, the metal, with a Roman numeral indicating the charge of the ion or the oxidation state, as we'll find out in subsequent lectures. So here is a uh, ion. This is manganese, manganese two plus. It is an ion with a charge two plus. If I make an oxide out of this like this, okay, this is manganese oxide, I have to specify the charge of the manganese ion. In this case, two. So the name for this is not manganese oxide, 
It's manganese 2 oxide, like this. Because manganese is a type 2 metal that can exist in multiple oxidation states. Here's another one. It can exist in oxidation state 3 plus. Manganese 3 plus, the oxide that follows from it has a different formula. So there's multiple manganese oxides. And I can specify them based on the oxidation state of the cation. This is called manganese 3 oxide, which has a very different formula than manganese 2 oxide. Manganese can yet exist in another oxidation state where the charge of the cation <coughs> is 4 plus, and in this case, the oxide that follows from that cation is manganese O2. It has two oxide anions. The name of this compound is manganese 4 oxide. So here you see the necessity of specifying with the Roman numeral the oxidation state of the metal. Yes? The question is, how do you differentiate between a type 1 and a type 2? So remember from the last lecture, there was a periodic table with colors. Okay? And in that periodic table, there were metals. Some of these have only one option, the other ones have multiple options. <coughs> so um, those are the ones you have to know. Yeah, to yeah, that's right. But a rule of thumb, actually, the first two columns of the pair table are always type 1. Okay? Those are the alkali and alkaline uh, uh, metals. Yes? No, no, no. You use the Roman numerals for every binary ion compound that has a type 2 metal in it. Okay, we'll see more examples of this. Yes? Is that something we need to memorize then? What you need to know is whether the metal is a type 1 or a type 2. And as you'll see, this is not completely arbitrary. Because the first two columns of the pair table, sorry, from the left, are type 1 metals. Okay? That's not hard to memorize. And aluminum is one of them, too. On the other side. But all the metals in the middle, so to speak, are generally tied to. There are a couple of exceptions. But. OK, so this is the same table from last time. I'm showing it once again. These are common type 2 ions. OK? It would be good if you know them. You don't have to know them by heart necessarily, but be familiar with them enough that you may recognize them, or you know that, you know, iron, for instance, iron, true positive, three positive, is rather very common. It's helpful if you're familiar with it. You don't have to reproduce this table per se. That's not the purpose. The purpose is you can work with this, right? You can work with this in the sense that you can find the names of these compounds. <coughs> So here's an example. This is copper 1 chloride. If I would call this just copper chloride, I would be making a mistake. Because I have to specify what the oxidation state for copper is. Copper is a type 2 metal that can exist in several oxidation states, among which 2 plus and plus. I need to specify which copper cation I'm talking about. This is copper 1 chloride. Copper 2 chloride would have a different formula. It would have looked like copper and then two chlorine anions, right? It's a different compound. This is iron three oxide. How do you know that? Well, there's three and not two. Because there is three of these oxides. Oxide is always two minus. Three of them means six. Six negative charges. That means if you have two of these, then the charge of the iron cation must be three plus. Right? So this is what you should be able to figure out. If, you, if I give you, if you give you this name of the compound, you should be able to write this one in vice versa. Okay, how about this? Now let's look at the chart here. I see here two types of mercury. It's a little funny. Mercury 2 plus is here, and mercury 1 is uh, also 2 plus, but has two mercuries together. So this is basically two mercuries together, and the overall charge is 2 plus. Right. special situation. In this case, what I have is 
mercury and oxygen. This is two minus, so this must be two plus. That is this guy right here. Mercury, two oxide. How about this? What is this? This is lead. Is it lead two or lead four? It's lead two, right? Because Cl is Cl minus. That means two negative charges. That means this must be two plus. Oh, that was fast. So this is, the, again, another chart I showed last time. Okay? And this is a table, once again. You should be able, I can, I can, I can ask you to memorize this, which is really more than is needed. You have to be able to work with this. Work with this. Recognize the names. That's the kind of idea. You don't have to reproduce this table. But you have to be able to work with the, with the compounds that are on it. Again, there is systematic in this table, especially in terms of those compounds that contain oxygen uh, atoms. For instance, the nitrate and nitrate. This guy, which has one oxygen less, is called nitrite, and the one that has one oxygen more is called nitrate. And the same holds for sulfite and sulfate. I said it last time, I said it again. Okay? But note that sulfite is O3, and nitrite is O2. So the I and H doesn't specify how many. It just specifies relative to the H, the I is well less. All right? That's the convention. You see, the same thing is reproduced on this side. Okay? This is chloride. This is chloride. This is chlorate, which is one more. And then hypochlorite has one less. So hypo, I, H, and then perchlorate has one more. So from one to four oxygens. Oxo anions have this kind of nomenclature. Okay, so again, we'll work with this and you'll see in what way you have to be able to reproduce this information. All right, so now let's move on to another type of compound, not ionic, but covalent. Binary covalent, meaning two types of elements make up this compound, and they are covalently bonded. Here are two examples. This is nitrogen monoxide. It is a covalent compound. Neither of these elements are metallic. Okay, so this is a covalent link between them. This is called nitrogen monoxide. Okay, this is also a covalent compound, sulfur dioxide. None of these elements is metallic, so this is a covalent compound. The name is sulfur dioxide. How do you determine the name of these covalent Compound, these binary covalent compounds. Here's the set of rules. If you follow these, you will be fine. Okay. Again, the first element is named first. In this case, nitrogen. In this case, sulfur. The second element is named as if it were an anion. Okay? It's not an anion. It's covalently linked. But just pretend it is because that's what the naming The naming follows the same kind of recipe. Then prefixes denote the number of atoms. If there's one, mono, two, di, tri, tetra for four, penta for five, hexa for six. Okay? But the prefix mono is never used for the first element. Okay, so let's, let's put it into practice and see what that means. Here's one. This is an element, this is a, sorry, a compound composed of two elements, phosphorus and chlorine. Both are not metals, it's a covalent compound. A binary covalent compound for that matter. What I have to do is name the first element first, that is phosphorus. The second one, as if it were an anion. That means chloride. So, phosphorus, chloride. However, I have to specify the number of atoms. There's one phosphorus and three chlorines. That means, if I follow this, this rule over here, this should be called monophosphorus trichloride. However, the last rule says the prefix mono is never used for the first element. So, I drop the mono for the first. Hence, phosphorus trichloride. Phosphorus trichloride. Another one. This is nitrogen, two of it, and then one oxygen. Also a covalent compound. I see two 
nitrogen. So I call this di because definitely this is not one. Mono I can't really use for the first element, but di I can. So di nitrogen and then one oxygen, monoxide. Di nitrogen, monoxide. Okay, so the naming is different than the naming for the binary ionic compounds. You specify the number of atoms. Okay, we'll practice a few later. Let's first move to another set of important compounds, namely acids. Okay, what is an acid? We'll talk about it extensively uh, close to the second midterm, not now. But very briefly, an acid is a substance that when you dissolve it in water, the cation is split off, forming a dissolved hydrogen ion or a proton. Now, acids are typically written with an H as their first element. Like here, HCl. This is called hydrochloric acid. This is another acid. It starts with an H. This is sulfuric acid. So how do we find out the name of these compounds? All right. Now, let's first distinguish two types of acids, one that contains an oxygen atom, and one that does not. So let's start with the one that does not contain an oxygen atom, like this one here. How do you name that? All right, here we go. You add the prefix hydro okay, to the anion name. And then the suffix ic is added to the anion name. So this is chlorine. I add hydro to it, hydrochlorine, but I, then I change the suffix into ic. So hydrochloric acid. So I always add the word acid to the final name. Hydrochloric acid. You add hydro as a suffix, and you add ic as um, hydro as a prefix, and suffix ic to the anion. Here's one. This is a compound. It's an acid. It starts with an H. Uh, it has no oxygen, so I have to follow this, uh, this set of rules. This is sulfur, and uh, this hydro comes in front. So hydro sulfuric acid. Hydro sulfuric acid. Another one, what is this? Hydrobromic acid, hydrobromic acid. Okay. All right, so keep that in mind. And then we'll skip over to acids that do have an oxygen present. And it's different. Because if it has an oxygen, what I have to do is I start with the anion name, be it an elemental anion or a polyatomic anion, as you will see in a few seconds. And then to this anion name, if this thing ends in eight, I add the suffix ic. But if it ends in eight, I replace it by us. Remember, those polyatomic anions contain an oxygen, they can end in eight or eight. And depending on whether they N and A or I, I have to do different things. So let me give you a couple of examples. This here is an acid. It starts with an H. It has an oxygen in it. In fact, this is a polyatomic anion. This is phosphate. Phosphate. So I take that word phosphate, and then I substitute H for ic. Phosphoric acid. Here's another one. An acid. This is the polyatomic anion. Its name is sulfate. And I changed the A into ic. Sulfuric acid. I take the root name of the anion. Sulfuric acid is the name of this compound. Here's another one. This is an acid. It contains an oxygen. This is nitrite. Okay. It ends in ite, so this should be nitrous acid. Oops, that was too fast. Nitrous acid. So whether the polyatomic anion containing an oxygen ends in ate or ite, we use the topic ate or ice. That's it. All right, finally, the last set of topics. 
substances or compounds we're looking at are the so-called hydrates. What are these? Well, hydrates are compounds that have a specific number of water molecules incorporated in the structure. Here's an example. This is cobalt 2 chloride, but in the lattice structure are incorporated six water molecules per cobalt chloride unit. So each cobalt chloride unit has six water molecules associated with it. And that unit repeats itself throughout the crystal. The proper name of this compound is cobalt 2 chloride hexahydrate. I infer already how the naming goes. The naming is as follows. Write the name of the root compound, which is cobalt chloride, and add the prefix hydrate to the root. Prefix meaning the number of water molecules. Okay? In this case, six. So hexahydrate. Here's one. This is barium chloride dihydrate. Two water molecules. Add it to barium chloride. How about this one? How is this? Copper two, copper two sulfate pentahydrate. Okay, it's copper two because the sulfate anion has a two minus charge. 2 minus, that means that the copper must be 2 plus. And I have to specify because copper is a type 2 metal. So copper 2 sulfate, pentahydrate. Alright? Alright, well that, those are the set of rules for these kind of compounds. And we talked about binary ionic, binary covalent, <coughs> acids, both acids that contain an oxygen and acids that do not contain an oxygen, and hydrates. Those are the ones that we talked about. So we should be able to name these compounds properly. This is just a small subset of the total number of compounds, of course, right? But these are the simplest ones we should be able to deal with them. OK, so a few common stinkers. This is not iron chloride, because iron is a type 2 metal. It is iron 3 chloride. Now, I can predict that on the midterm, and the final for that matter, there will be about 25% of the people that just forget about the Roman numeral. Okay? Every, every year, the people can just forget the Roman numeral. About 25%. And let it not be you. Okay? Just be mindful. Even if it's type 2, add this Roman numeral to it. Another one. What is this? A very common problem with this one is that some people think it looks a lot like SO3 2 minus on the table of polyatomic anions. It's called sulfite. Okay? This is something that, again, about 20% of people call this sulfite. It's not sulfite. This is not an ion. This is a neutral molecule. Okay? This is sulfur trioxide. Okay, how about this? Well, I put this in here because <coughs> some people call this hydrogen carbonate. This is a carbonate anion, this is hydrogen, so this is not wrong necessarily. But we do consider this wrong in this particular context because it says aqueous. That means this thing is dissolved in water. Once it's dissolved in water, it is an acid. Okay? We don't call this hydrogen carbonate anymore. It's called carbonic acid. All right. Why is it called carbonic acid? Because this is carbonate. It is an acid. It ends in 8 and becomes A. Carbonic acid. Here's another one. This is a compound that contains selenium and fluorine. It is a covalent compound. A lot of folks call this selenium fluoride. It's not correct because it is selenium hexafluoride. The hexa has to be in there because this is a covalent compound. And so this hexa indicates what kind of compound it is. If you say selenium fluoride, you consider this to be a binary ionic compound, which it is not. 
How about this one? Covalent compound containing nitrogen and oxygen. Some people call this nitrogen trioxide. It's almost right, but not quite, because it is dinitrogen trioxide. Why do people drop the dye? Because they tend to drop the mono, and then they drop everything. Okay, but it's like di, tri, tetra. It doesn't matter. But if it's only the mono, only the mono prefix is dropped from the first element. That's it, nothing else. OK, another example. Select the cases in which the compound name correctly matches the formula. OK, so here I have a, a series of compounds. Let's see if the name is correct or not. Rubidium selenide. Yes, says the person. Now, in this particular case, and then, you know, this is maybe a little bit too early for you to completely know this, but I have to check whether or not the charges are correct. Rubidium is always 1 plus. Okay? Rubidium is actually the first column of the pair table. Those ions always have 1 plus. The second column has always 2 plus. Rubidium must be 1 plus. Selenium is 2 minus. So this is not neutral. Okay? This is not, not correct for that matter. Another example. Rubidium iodide. Is that, is that good? Yeah, this one is good because iodide always has negative one. And rubidium is one plus, like we just saw. Okay, how about this one? No! <laughs> it's wrong. Good answer. Telluride is two minus, this is one plus, is not correct. How about the, the fourth? Sodium bromide, is, is that correct? No, it's not correct. Sodium is a... First column, okay, Macaulay metal. And it's one plus bromine, one minus, so this should be just NaBr. Then it will be sodium bromide. In this case, it's not. This, this compound does not exist. How about this? Rubidium sulfide. Sulfide is two minus, rubidium one plus, incorrect. And finally, this one here. Complete nonsense. Three is one minus, three of them, three minus. Rubidium has only one plus. Doesn't work. All right, so this, this is kind of the kind of exercise you have to be able to do. And, uh, and things like this. Enter the formula for each compound. So we'll start with cesium iodate. This is kind of a tricky situation because iodate we haven't talked about. Okay? So let's see where that is. Iodate is an iodine atom with three oxygens. Just like carbonate is a carbon with three oxygens. Okay. Cesium iodate is a combination of these two guys. Both have charge one minus. Sorry, one minus here, one plus for the cesium. You put them together, they form a neutral compound. So this is the formula for cesium iodate. Iodate is a compound I'm showing it to you, so you know it exists. It's not part of the table. You have to be able to work with it. But this is just to indicate that there's more beyond that table. Okay? And the chemistry is not just summarizing a small little table. It's much more than that. I'm just giving you a flavor. Don't be afraid. Iron 2 carbonate is composed of iron 2 plus and the carbonate anion, which happens to be 2 minus. Okay, so when you put them together, they form a nice neutral compound. Iron CO3. How how about this? Cesium sulfate. Cesium 1 plus sulfate SO4 2 minus. There it is. This is 2, this is 1, so I need 2 cesiums. Cesium 2 SO4. Chromium 3 chloride. Okay, there's a 3 here, that means that chromium is in its oxidation state 3. That means 3 plus for the charge of the cation. Chlorine is always one minus. I need three chlorines to make a neutral compound, so it's chromium Cl3. That is chromium uh, chloride, a beautiful purple compound. Very nice. I 
That's it. That's it. That's true. Okay. Before you guys go, let me make a one plug. One plug. Uh, I sent folks an email and on the website. Uh, we have a forum called the Yelp forum for people that try it. Uh, it is actually a great means to discuss things with your peers. If you don't, if, if you're on to solve the question on the homework, for instance, you can just ask questions online and hopefully somebody will answer the question, including myself. So try to use it. It's a great tool. And we'll see you at the end of the uh, paper. We'll be happy that it's there.